Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Stephen Marsh, a novelist and culture writer who has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, Esquire, and many other outlets. His books include three novels, The Hunger of the Wolf, Raymond and Hannah, and Shining at the Bottom of the Sea, as well as The Unmade Bed and How Shakespeare Changed Everything. His latest book, just out today, is The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. And he has an article at The Guardian, The next U.S. Civil War is already here. We just refuse to see it. Welcome to Background Briefing, Stephen Marsh. Pleased to be here. Well, thanks for joining us. And history is full of unexpected and sometimes tectonic and traumatic events, like, for example, the Soviet Union collapsed. Nobody predicted it, or very few did. It happened yep. almost overnight. And as you point out in your article at The Guardian, the next U.S. civil war is already here. We just refuse to see it. The civil war, on the eve of the civil war, most Americans had no idea that it was going to happen. And even, even uh, as you mentioned, South Carolina Senator James Chestnut, who did more than most to bring on the advent of the catastrophe, thought that only enough blood to fill a thimble would be spilled. And yet it turned out to be the most bloody war in American history to this day. There's still more casualties in the Civil War than there were in any of the wars America has fought. And on a per capita basis, of course, given the small population back then, it is an absolutely horrendous bloodletting. So uh, you feel that this is yet what we're living through, a similar period of denial about something that's staring us in the face? Well, I don't know if it's a similar period of denial because the the you know in the, in the first civil war uh, like Fort Sumter, the assault on Fort Sumter happened, and Jefferson Davis said it's probably nothing. So they were in a real they 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 really did not see it coming. Um, on the other hand, I think in our own moment we're also kind of blind to the very deep structural uh, crises that are afflicting America right now and which are 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 blossoming into violence. So. You know, no no periods are exactly the same. And of course, a, a contemporary civil war would be nothing like the first civil war. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's quite natural to be blind to what's staring you right in the face when it comes to the horrors of history. Well, one of the more alarming statistics that I've come across uh, recently is one that, of course, is pretty well known. And that is that there's almost 400 million guns in the hands of civilians in this country. But a yes. recent study from the University of Chicago, you know, there are variously, some say 70, some say 80 percent of Republicans believe that Biden's an illegitimate president and Trump won the election. Within that group, about 22 million Americans believe that uh, violence may be necessary to put their guy, Trump, in his rightful place back in the White House. Yeah, I mean, I don't think... I, and I mean, there was a more alarming uh, poll more recently that said one third of Americans believe that it was OK to use violence against your own government. Um, so, yeah, you're seeing things like the state lose the monopoly on violence, which are, you know, once that starts happening, things tend to fall apart pretty quickly. Like once you lose the the peaceful transition of power, that 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 is really sacred. And once it's gone, it's it's kind of gone. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's happening on a, on a number of fronts. I mean, I, I also think like the general feeling of the legitimacy of government on both sides is waning. I mean, you have five out of nine Supreme court justices selected by a president who was, who did not win the popular vote. Um, by 2040, uh, 68% of the Senate will be controlled by 30% of the population. The electoral college, you know, is inevitably without any question going to produce a Republican president who loses the popular vote by many, many millions of votes. And I think that will that will cause, uh, you know, like people on the right are, are quite used to thinking of the government as illegitimate. They've been thinking that way since the 80s, at least. Um, or, I mean, you could say they've been thinking that way since the 1880s. But I think on the left, the people on the left are starting to realize, OK, this is not really a functioning democracy. It does not it does not represent popular will anymore. And as you argue in your article at The Guardian, the problem is not who is in power, but the structures of power. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the like, I think we, it's so easy to get caught up in, especially with Trump. Trump to me is very much just a symptom. Like, I, I, I really believe that everything I wrote in this book would have happened if, if Hillary Clinton had been elected. Like, these are in 2016. I mean, these are 
these are deep trends. They are structural. And, and you know, I, I think it's really important. Like, it's so easy to get caught up in horse race politics, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene being cut from Twitter or something. You know, that's not where the focus should be. The focus should be on this very serious problem that the Constitution is broken. And, you know, I'm not it's a it's a work of great genius, but it's just decrepit and old and and no longer reflects reality. And um, and it, it's a very dubious proposition anymore that there is such a thing as American political unity on any number of questions. So, yeah, I like I don't think, you know, hating on Marjorie Taylor Greene or hating on Donald Trump are uh, fun activities, but they're not they're not helpful. Like the like the, the, the problems are much deeper than them. And I take it that the problems are largely to do with the enormous amount of alienation in this country that Hillary Clinton talked about that constituency as, as the deplorables, but it yeah. was the constituency that elected Donald Trump, and it is largely the constituency that now controls the Republican Party. And what I find extraordinary is that as much as you can identify him, and I agree with you, you know, and that, beating up on these clowns that represent the new face of the Republican Party, along with Trump, is a sort of worthless and painful exercise in futility. But trying to understand what makes this constituency tick is something that there's, it's very lacking, I feel, and I wish I had some answers, except to say that the alienation is total, and there are no programs and no policies. There's no platform. The, the GOP doesn't have a platform. So... What explains that? Anger and alienation, but yet no ideas about what to do or how they should govern or even what they want. Well, I mean, I think I could divide it into two answers, both of which are quite depressing, unfortunately. I mean, the first one is that I think American government has essentially entered a, entered a post-policy phase where, you know, actual government like the build back better bill is treated as this huge accomplishment although we don't know if it's going to happen as we're as we're speaking right now but you know for every other mature democracy that's that's a wednesday that's just a budget like it's not that that's not some huge legislative achievement and the legislature the the uh, the congress is increasingly unable to do basic things like guarantee its own debt or or you know even you know provide security for itself in form in the form of uh, an inquiry into the people who attacked it. So the government's entering a period where it is essentially paralyzed and helpless. And at the same time, uh, you know, th there's a very important demographic shift where um, African Americans and Latino Americans are are rising, and and in terms of population and also in terms of their prosperity. And everywhere around the world, where you know marginalized groups get towards equality over you know reach towards privileged groups, the privileged groups fight back and. You can see that everywhere. That's not an American ph phenomenon. It's not distinct to the particular American psychoses around race. Um, it is, it, or neuroses around race. It is, it is something that you see in India between Hindus and Muslims. It's something you see in Europe. It's something you see in all over Africa and the Middle East. And it's now it's happening in America as lower groups rise up to equality. Violence ensues. And I, I think to me, if you're asking me what's the source of this, that's that's the that's the source of this toxic energy. And again, I'm speaking with Stephen March, who is a novelist and culture writer who has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, Esquire and many other outlets. His books include three novels, The Hunger of the Wolf, Raymond and Hannah and Shining at the Bottom of the Sea, as well as The Unmade Bed and How Shakespeare Changed Everything. And his latest book out today is The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. And he has an article at The Guardian, The Next U.S. Civil War is Already Here. We Just Refuse to See It. So, Stephen, is that to say that a secession in many ways is already underway? Not a bloody one like the Civil War, but one in which a lot of Americans in red state America simply don't want to live with the rest of us, particularly with the minorities that you mentioned are on the rise, the African-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Latinos in particular. The state of Texas and Florida would be examples where they're just passing laws, essentially, to maintain a tyranny of the minority. And if you combine that with uh, what you were talking about earlier, how 68% of, uh, what was that? 68% of the country, and 30% of the country will control 68% yeah, of the Senate. Right. If you combine that with 
that statistic, then I think you know you can make the argument that we are. I don't know whether we're heading into a permanent tyranny of the minority, but we're certainly heading into a tyranny of the minority if it hasn't already arrived. Well, it has already arrived. I mean, there's already been a lot of presidents who didn't win the majority vote, and the Supreme Court, as I said, is five out of nine of them are elected by were selected by presidents who didn't win the popular vote. I mean, the problem with secession, and much of the book is about secession, because I think honestly, it's. It, I mean, it sounds horrible to say, but I think it's one of the best case scenarios for the future of, of America right now. Um, and it, it's not just the right, you know, it's not just it, it's popular in both red states and blue states and, and, and increasingly on both sides. I mean, you know, the, the right has had this for a long time. The left is really going to ask have to ask itself probably within this year whether it wants to live in a country where abortion is illegal, you know, and whether that's the kind of country that it wants to belong to. Um, you know, so the, so secession, I don't think, is necessarily a crazy idea. On the other hand, it's totally unconstitutional. The U.S. Constitution makes it more or less impossible to do because of the 14th Amendment. Um, you would need a, a total constitutional convention to make it happen. And then the other thing is that the U.N. actually makes it, you know, it's quite a it's quite a difficult process. Now, that, that said, it's not impossible. Like there are there are three times as many countries today as there were in 1945, but but on the other hand, it's not as simple as people want it, therefore it's going to happen. I mean, a, a large number of Americans want secession. Uh, like, like in the Republican Party, it would be a majority. Um, so, yeah, I I, I mean, it, I, I'm sort of torn because I I do think it's worth talking about. It's definitely a, a conversation that Americans should be having. But on the other hand, it, it's not. It's very very complicated and and a, and a thorny legal issue. Sure, but from the point of view of the left, if you consider the blue states of California and New York, for example, mm -hmm. um, here in California, we subsidize Mississippi. And oh, you do? Yeah, I mean, South Carolina gets $7 for every dollar it, it pays in taxes, right? Yes, you absolutely do subsidize them. I mean, so does Texas, but, you know, yeah, that, that is absolutely true. Now, I mean... In ordinary times of solidarity, I don't think that would matter very much. But when they're, you know, going to change your laws, then and control your and control your legal system, it, not through necessarily through pseudo democratic means, it feels different, doesn't it? Right. But practically, I don't know how mm -hmm. you can do it, and and in doing so, you condemn any kind of progressive in Mississippi to a future, a sort of medieval future. Well, I don't I mean, I think what they would say, you know, you could make the argument from their point of view, which I've certainly researched and seen, and they would say that they would be dooming you to godless communism. Right. right. So, like, okay. I mean, at, at a certain point, that's, like, a fair that's a fair trade, right? I mean, when when marriages reach the point that the United States has reached, like you sit the children down and say, you know, it's very painful, but sometimes people have to break up and. You know, I, I really think like the differences between just to take as an example, like Mississippi, Tennessee and, and California, the differences between those two places are not merely political. They're 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 you can chart them in a whole number of social ways, including corporal punishment in schools, uh, gun ownership, church attendance. Uh, you know, these are really these are different political entities and I, I mean, different social entities as well as an outsider. Like as someone who you know is from a different country, they they are very different to me, and the fact that they're the same country doesn't really make sense. So in the short term, though, what you are suggesting here, let me quote, quote from your article at the Guardian, Stephen, mm -hmm. what the American left needs now is allegiance, not allyship. It must abandon any imagined fantasies about the sanctity of government institutions that long ago gave up any claim to legitimacy. Stack the Supreme Court, end the filibuster, make Washington, D.C. a state, and let the dogs howl, and now, yeah. before it's too late. Yeah, I mean, you know, none of those things are extra democratic. They're all part of the democratic process. They've all been done before um, in the 30s. I mean, I, I think the filibuster is probably going to end by the by the end of this week. Um, but, you know, like, I, I think one of the things is that if you're if you're if you're operating on, well, the other side isn't going to regard these decisions as legitimate. That's just nonsense. They don't regard anything that you do as legitimate and they don't really care 
about the legitimacy of these institutions. I mean, Mitch McConnell's shown that a, a million times. That's not you're not dealing with people that you that you can somehow convince. Well, let's 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 we'll, we'll all play baseball and it'll all it'll all be we'll all follow the rules. That's not that's not the game they're playing and it's not the rules that they respect. So I I, I just think there's a there's a kind of inertia among certain kind of American liberals who've been educated that their country is the solution to history and that the American system is the greatest system the world has ever known. Um, who don't who who don't really think who don't really understand how vulnerable it is and how and how easily it can be lost and and then and, and also when it's lost it, it's really lost you know like it it, it will it, it will become illegitimate and when people stop believing in it violence tends to ensue and get that goes back to my initial observation about the mm -hmm. Soviet Union collapsing almost overnight do you think America could collapse or at least become a one party <sighs> State run by Trump's GOP. You know, I, I this is a book of prediction, and there are imagined scenarios. But I really like to stay as close to what I know as possible. Like as close. Like the, the 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 thing about this book is that it's the it's the best available models. It's not worst case scenarios. It's not best case scenarios. It's like here are the best available models. Here's where they're heading. And you know what those models, how those models operate, is on what they call a complex cascading system, which is like weather in the sense that a, a whole bunch of factors feed into each other and, and enter feedback loops with each other. And that's why shocking things keep happening. Like why things that, you know, even though we have this, uh, you know, amazing political commentary in the United States, they don't, they don't see what's happening um, very clearly because things seem to come out of the blue. And, you know, civil wars tend to be that way. So Russia is one example. The English Civil War is also another example where they really didn't think it was going to happen until it happened, you know, in 1644. And it, th there's also there's a, there's also a number of examples of that in South America and Africa and other places. Um, so, you know, the, the, the problem with pre with predicting this stuff, like giving specific where's and when's and what will what will happen, I, you know, I don't, I don't really want to play with that because the, the, dealing with the facts are, are tough enough and, and and the fact but the facts would say that america is about to enter a period of extreme turbulence um violent violence is definitely rising and the institutions that can control violence are being you know uh slowly losing legitimacy so that it, it's just a very very dangerous period and how and when the fall will come no one can know but the trend is definitely going one way well stephen march i thank you very much for joining us here today my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. As much as one can enjoy a dep depressing conversation. Yeah, I know. Is it, is it, is it, is it, is it depressing? Is it, is it enjoyable or not? I could tell. It was a pleasure okay. talking to you anyway. Well, thank you. And again, I've been speaking with Stephen March, who is a novelist and culture writer who has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, Esquire, and many other outlets. His books include three novels, The Hunger of the Wolf, Raymond and Hannah, and Shining at the Bottom of the Sea, as well as The Unmade Bed and How Shakespeare Changed Everything. And his latest book out today is The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. And he has an article at The Guardian, The Next U.S. Civil War is Already Here. We Just Refuse to See It. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters, and I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon. And to help us sustain this program into the future and assure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or publictruthmedia.org, where you will find our nonprofit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And if you missed any of today's program and would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we'll include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we also encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media. And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family, and colleagues. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another Background Briefing at backgroundbriefing.org. Bye for now. The guy that lived next door in 305 Took the kids to the park and disappeared by half past nine
Honey, you're the big 